supply your memory, I will quickly go through uh, <coughs> what we covered last time. Nothing much, we just broke the aircraft into four parts. And uh, our aim is to calculate or estimate the gross weight of the aircraft as a function of uh, <coughs> these four components of which two are given to us by the user. And uh, using that we create this uh, simple equation which is iterative in nature because W e bar empty weight fraction inside it already has W0. So just to refresh your memory, uh, the two unknowns. So the unknowns are determined. First we look at the empty weight fraction. For that we use this formula from Ramos textbook where A and C are constants for a given aircraft type. This table gives you A and C and uh, yesterday somebody pointed out or last time someone pointed out that there are no UAVs in this. Okay? So what I did, I looked at the Ramos textbook, the new edition and there you go. In the new edition, Ramos has inserted the equations for UAVs. So now we have the data for UAVs also. And he breaks them into three types of UAV, um, reconnaissance UAV and uh, unmanned combat aerial vehicles. Then UAV for high altitude and there will be a talk on the design of UAV for high altitude very soon. Uh, actually next Friday morning you will have a talk by one of my PhD students on design of uh, UAV. So notice that uh, size really makes a big difference uh, in these numbers. And these are the trends that we saw. Then we looked at actual aircraft trends. We saw that for one particular aircraft type, they match very well. Then we looked at the components of the weight for the fuel. So now we are trying to address the fuel weight fraction. We said that you can break the mission into various segments. And if we assume that there is no sudden loss of weight or sudden gain of weight, then multiplication of weight ratios for each mission segment. I am just revising what we did last time. We will give you the mission fuel fraction. And uh, some of these fractions we have uh, knocked off by using historical data, especially the ones for takeoff, climb, descent, approach, land. So ultimately we have only two fuel fractions remaining. Uh, we looked at bigger range equation and we saw that there are three players, the three disciplines and the one that makes it happen which is guidance and control. This is a bigger range equation for um, a jet engine aircraft. So we notice that uh, R, V are given by the user, L by D is to be estimated which is today's task. C cruise is from the engine data, having uh, obtained these values or estimated them, we can get the weight fraction for the cruise. Similar equation for uh, endurance and there was one homework assignment given that kindly prove that L by D loiter is equal to 0.866 L by D max for prop aircraft and vice versa. So, so far I have not got any communication from your group about this. I want you to look at the performance textbooks and I want you to derive. Okay. So, I am sorry, then that is from your batch. I thought he is from the MTEC batch, sorry. So, yes, first he sent a write up and then he has sent a PDF. So, great. Where is Pradyumna? Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It is correct. What you have done is very right. And it is not a simple thing. Uh, it was a question which I used to ask in the end semester examination and very few people were able to derive it in the examination. So it is a big contribution but now you know that there is this relationship available. Okay, This is where we were on 26th of August. Now we start. So what is remaining? What is remaining is L by D max. If you can get the value of L by D max, you can use the appropriate number for uh, the Brigade range or the Brigade endurance formula. And one more thing is remaining. Remember, we have derived the formula only for jet engine aircraft using TSFC. But you know, there are props also. So today we will track these two things. Once again, we look at history, but not just history. Now we look at semi-empirical methods, not just empirical methods. Okay. Now, L by D max is a very important aerodynamic parameter. In fact, this one parameter captures the aerodynamic efficiency if the Mach number is fixed. So this should be as high as possible and uh, to get this value you have to struggle a lot and normally you need to have in front of you the configuration. But then we are not having that luxury. So we have to go for some 
assumption. First, we look at a very, very basic simple thumb rule. Okay. Now, here I want to give you a word of caution. This thumb rule is purely based on a study of a graph like this, which has come from practical data. So, what do you see in the graph? We see on the x axis Mach number, on the y axis we see L by D max. And we notice that for aircraft which are predominantly subsonic between 0 to 1, there are these various lines. These lines do not change too much. So, the median point are these symbols for these lines. And these uh, symbols are for various aspect ratios starting from aspect ratio of uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So, if aspect ratio is 10, L by D max is nearly 20. If aspect ratio is uh, 8, L by D max is nearly 17 to 18. If L by D max is, uh, if aspect ratio is 6, you are, uh, this is around 16. So, based on this, there is some very simple thumb rule. For aspect ratio between 7 to 11 and not below 7, not above 11, L by D max is simply twice of the wing aspect ratio. This is a very simple thumb rule. The problem is many of you smart guys will start with this and end with this. So, you will say that aspect ratio is 8, therefore L by D max is 16. Oh yeah, no, do not worry about configuration, aerodynamics, aerofoil, shape, sweep, twist, taper. No. Remember, it is only a starting point. It is acceptable at this stage when you do not have any data. But just aspect ratio can you use it to measure or estimate L by D max? No, because aspect ratio mainly affects only the lift to lift curve slope. But hey, it also affects the drag because drag has a term called as CDI induced drag which is CL square by pi AE. So, aspect ratio directly shows up in drag in terms of the induced drag coefficient. Aspect ratio shows up in lift in terms of the lift curve slope. That is why it has a role in L and also in D. Hence, to some extent, aspect ratio will affect L by D. Fine. So, use this thumb rule if and only if you do not have any other way to go. Otherwise, you can use other methods. One more thing we see here is, irrespective of the sweep of the uh, of the uh, sorry, irrespective of the aspect ratio of the wing. L by D max is never going to cross 10 if you fly supersonic and it will become as bad as 5 or 4 when you fly at high Mach numbers. For space shuttle, L by D max is only 3 because it flies at Mach 10 or even more, right. So, as you have very high flights, aspect ratio, sorry, L by D is going to be low because D is going to be very, very high. Whatever you do, there will be very high drag because there will be wave drag and there will be shock induced separation at high Mach numbers, there can be. So, aspect ratio does not really help too much. It helps in subsonic. You can notice in subsonic there is a huge effect of aspect ratio, but in supersonic aspect ratio does not play much role in improving L by D max. It is going to be bad, bad and bad. Okay. Now, do we have some better data? Yes, Raymer has given some better data. So, again he has looked at the data for existing aircraft, break, broken down them into various categories and he gives you the L by D max and then he says, okay, one number average is given here. So, you might say, okay, my aircraft is a business jet. Therefore, I will take as L by D as 14.3 starting point. Acceptable. Similarly, various aspect ratios, uh, various uh, aircraft types, you can assume some L by D max here, but only as a starting point, not as the end point. Then there is some data, actual data for L by D of some small piston turboprop aircraft, the so called GA aircraft, Cessna 310, Beechcraft Bonanza, Cessna Cardinal around 13 to 14. The purpose of showing you all this is to sensitize you that the number that you choose should be a number which is reasonable, do not take 1.3, do not take 30, 130, okay. it should be somewhere in this ballpark. Okay. Let us understand how it is driven, subsonic now, now we do not worry about because we saw that in high speed flight in 
supersonic Mach numbers L by D is not affected by uh, aspect ratio. So, let us see what happens in subsonic case. Okay. In the subsonic case, it depends on configuration, it depends on what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of uh, configuration you choose and also to some extent on the layout. So, if you look at level flight, then lift is equal to weight, therefore L will depend upon D. Okay. Uh, uh, and there are two main components. In other words, L will not be more than W. So, you cannot keep on increasing L. You cannot say, I want more L by D, let us pump more aerodynamics, let us get more lift, because then you cannot fly level, you will be climbing. So, you can increase L only or rather you have to keep L equal to W, therefore L is not in your hand, but you can reduce B, that is in your hand. So, L by D will be increased primarily by reducing D and not by increasing L. So, let us look at D which is drag. Now, drag has, we will have a special lecture on drag estimation where we will elaborate more on the drag, but very, very basic issue is that there are two main drivers. One is the parasite drag or the drag even when there is no lift or the zero lift drag. That is a function of how much area of the aircraft comes in contact with the air. So, the area above the wing, the area below the wing, the area of the fuselage, the area of the tail, the area of anything that is projecting out, this whole thing is called as the wetted area. Okay. So, if you reduce wetted area, you will reduce the parasite drag, straight and simple. That is why we say make the aircraft small, it will be light, it will be also having less drag, it will become more agile. The next one is the induced drag or the lift dependent drag. This drag comes because there is lift. If you do not have lift, this drag does not come. So, because there is lift, there is a small amount of drag or not small, a component of drag called as the lift dependent drag. Now, this is a function of wingspan. This is basically a function of wingspan because as wingspan increases, the strength of the tip vertices decreases. So, this drag will be low if you have a slender long wing. It will be high if you have a wing like a space shuttle which is having a delta wing with low aspect ratio. Okay. So, the slender your wing or the lift generating surface, lesser will be the induced drag. So, one is a function of span, the other is a function of wetted area. So, now because span is affecting the aspect ratio, because aspect ratio is what span square by area, but what is the area in the definition of aspect ratio? Which area are we using? Okay, can somebody answer this? Can you answer on the last bench? Yes, no, behind you. I don't know. I don't know your name. What's your name? Hmm. Ah, Hetal. Do you know my question? Do I repeat the question? Okay, I'll repeat the question for you. We have a term called aspect ratio, which is span square by area. What is the area in that? Which area? wing area, but how do you define that wing area? So, is it, yeah, what, what do you think is the area? This was uh, discussed in the class by the way recently, huh? but do you have any idea? No? But you said wing area, which is right, but then what is it? Is it the area of top and bottom? Is it the area of cross section? What do you think? Top and bottom, okay. What do you think? What is your name? Atanna. What do you think? Which area? Top and bottom? Only top, plant form. So, it is not wing area, it is wing reference area. And it is defined as area in the plan view of the aircraft, including the portion inside the fuselage, extended to the center line. Now, Aspect ratio is span square by this reference area and wetted area is the whole area that, that is coming in contact with the air. So, this wetted area will include area of the wing 
top and bottom minus the area inside the fuselage because that is covered by a fuselage plus fuselage area plus tail area plus blah 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 all the areas. So, they have to, to bring into consideration both these effects. People define something called as a vetted aspect ratio, which would be span square by vetted area. Okay. It has no physical significance actually because it takes the wingspan, squares it, and divides it by the complete vetted area of the aircraft. The only purpose being let us capture the effect of span, that means induced drag, and vetted area, that means parasite drag. So, aspect ratio wet is called as AR wet and AR wet will be B square that is span square by S wet and because aspect ratio of wing is normally a design parameter, you can say that uh, AR wet will be equal to wing aspect ratio into also oh, divided by S wet by SRF. Okay. So, it is B square aspect ratio A of the wing, wing aspect ratio is span square by wing area. If I multiply this by, if I divide it by S wet by S ref, I will get span square by wetted area that is the wetted aspect ratio. So, many people uh, connect these two together. Now, wetted aspect ratio, yes, no we do not, we do not include the area, but the thing is uh, when we do the calculations, we do not assume that we will calculate only when the flow is separated. So, flow separation is something that you do not want to happen. Okay. So, during the flight of separated flow, okay, some area will not touch with the uh, touch. So, that the, the technically speaking, when you take every area during that condition, it will be lower. Agreed. But in a well designed aircraft, these areas are either 0 or very, very small. Yes. Next question. No, it is the aircraft wetted area. I mentioned na, including fuselage, including tail, including any projection. Because parasite drag does not see aircraft or wing. Parasite drag means you touch it, there will be drag. So, the wetted area consists of the complete aircraft area. <coughs> so, there is a statement that a wetted aspect ratio is a better indication of L by D max and not just wing aspect ratio because wing aspect ratio captures only and only the induced drag factor whereas a wetted aspect ratio captures induced drag factor through B square and parasite drag through wetted area. The proof of this is what we have already seen which is a figure from Weimar's textbook. So, you see there are two aircraft shown here, one of them is, remember I told you three, three companies designed an aircraft for the same requirement, strategic bomber, one from Russia, one from UK, one from US, they all had L by D max of how much? 17.1, 17.2, okay. And I asked all of you to search and tell me the L by D max of the Russian aircraft, nobody has responded so far, that is an unopened. But do we have that question on Moodle? So, why do not you put it, a month? Okay, there, is a, there are three aircrafts in our figure. So, which was the Russian aircraft? Tupolev, some, some, some Tupolev, some number, I forget the number. So, I want to know the L by D max of that aircraft. Just search and tell me. Okay, for these two, the L by D max is 17.1 and 17.2. So, let us see. The, now, this area, this, this look at the interesting thing. Now, the reference area, S ref of B 47 is only 1430. This is I think uh, this might be, yeah this should be in uh, feet square, that is my guess. Hmm? It should be in square feet. So, why is it 14 and look at Vulcan, Vulcan is 3446. So, it is nearly how much, how many times? Factor of 2 and a half to 3, correct. Why? Because Vulcan is only wing, very little else. In Vulcan, if you see on the right hand side, it is just a wing, big wing with a small fuselage and uh, no horizontal tail, only vertical tail. So, the S reference is going to be the wing reference area, which is the platform area of the wing as you see. And uh, in, the, in B47, you have a very thin narrow wing, so very small wing. So, the 
reference area is 1430 and 3446, but the wetted area of um, B47 is very large because compared to the wing that is too much of fuselage there is also horizontal tail which is quite large. Okay. So, if you add the area of all the other things including the wing area, you will find it is 11300. In the case of Vulcan, it is only 3446 into 2 because 3446 is the platform area into 2 plus the area of the other items. Okay. So, if you look at the wing span, one of them is 116, one of them is 90. So, not very different. But if you take S wet by SRF, ratio of wetted area upon the reference area is almost 8 for B47. That means, uh, apart from the wing, there are there is an area comparable to 7 times more, 7 wings. So, many things are constituting the whole aircraft. Whereas, in this case, it is 2.8, nearly 3. So, it is like top of the wing, bottom of the wing and one wing. That is the area. So, if you look at the aspect ratio, it is 9.4 and 3, but if you look at the wetted aspect ratio, it is 1.2 and 1.1. Okay. Take the ratio of span square by wetted area and because the wetted aspect ratio is almost the same, L by D max is also 17.2 and 17.0. So, this is one way of proving that wetted aspect ratio is a better capturing phenomena for L by D max. So, therefore, this is now semi empirical, this is called semi empirical that you do some kind of a scientific study. I remember one student presented a paper on this. So, he actually revisited these two aircraft, did a detailed CFD calculation and showed that indeed L by D max of these two aircraft at various conditions. It is a very interesting paper. I remember it was presented by a student from Purdue University. If I locate the paper, I will upload on the Moodle page. It is like uh, Vulcan and um, B-47 revisited something like that. Okay. So, now Raymond has given us this chart. Yes. So, are there any aircrafts where the ratio is below 2 as the fuselage is actually smaller than the projection of the No, it cannot be below 2 because look, if you take a flying wing, it will be 2 because reference area will be top and where it will be top and bottom. But you are projecting it into the fuselage, so the fuselage is very, very small. That's the no, no, there is no fuselage. In a flying there is no fuselage, there is no tail. In that case, I understand it will be 2. But suppose hmm. there is just a point fuselage yeah. and we will be projecting the wing into the center, but that area is actually not present. Huh. So, the wetted aspect ratio, this ratio or, or wetted aspect ratio will never be, the ratio will never be less than 2. It will be 2 or more. It may be 2.2. Do you understand my point? See, S wet by S ref. S wet is up area, bottom area. S ref is only top area if there is nothing else. So, the ratio is 2. Anything else you put, it will be more than 2 because numerator will have wing area, wing area plus anything else area. So, this ratio will never be below 2. How can it be below 2? SRF being the, like you projecting the wing into the fuselage as well, right? Correct. So, suppose I have a dot and two say rods going like this and then a wing. Mm -hmm. The projection is actually supposed to come till the center, right? That's mm -hmm. for SRF. Huh. And that area is actually not present. It is all hollow. It is just two rods and then the wing. That is how I am right? I do not understand. Two rods means what? These are laterally? One point, uh, one mm -hmm. very small circle mm -hmm. and then two rods going out from it and uh, two wings. How do you attach these wings? To the two rods. It's just point attachment. That's how I'm imagining it. Ah, you are you are trying to create something which will have an aspect ratio. Practically, it is not there. No? Practically, you will not have any situation practically where there will be two wings and one rod in between, and therefore the projected. So normally we assume there is a fuselage in the center, which is going to connect the two wings completely. Okay. So, uh, so okay, let me just come back to this. Now, this is a this is a graph which has been taken from Raymond's textbook again, and what it does is it is showing various 
configurations and they have given names also. For example, Boeing 747 is here, okay. Beach Starship, something about which we studied is here. This is Vulcan, this is Flying Wing. So, notice this is Flying Wing now, it is 2, okay. It is 2 or slightly more than 2 because there is this small fuselage. So, the area of that fuselage will be added, so it will be 2.1 or something like that, okay. And then you have things like uh, B 47, which is 8. So, Raymer has studied all these aircraft. He says that the aircraft that you design, if it is similar to one of these in looks, configuration, then he says you can eyeball the value of SVET by SRF. Now, my question is at this stage, can you actually calculate SVET by SRF for your aircraft? Why can't you do it? Where is the aircraft? We only have requirements. We have type in mind. So, if someone says let us design a single seat jet fighter, you will say okay, F102, F4, F104, they are all single seat jet fighters. But you know, this fellow is just a delta wing, so very suitable for interceptors and also this one F404. So, you might say okay, our baseline is something like F4, something like F4. So, they will say okay, F4. F4 has a S fed by SRF of nearly 4 point whatever, 4.2 or so. This point in the center is the numerical value of the ratio S fed by SRF. So, he calls it eyeballing the aircraft. That means, find your aircraft here and read on the y axis the approximate S fed by SRF that you will get for your aircraft, approximate to start with. You might say my aircraft is neither like B-47 nor like 747, it is in between, okay. Not as slender as B-47, but not as, look, not high sweep as compared to this. So, you will say, okay, this fellow has 6.2, this fellow has 7.8, let us take 6.5. So, you can do some approximation eyeballing of your aircraft. So, what is the purpose of this? to give you a reasonable estimate of S wet by S ref of the aircraft that you will design. Since you have not designed it, you cannot do it actually. When you revisit next iteration, you will say, oh no, 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 it is not 6.2, it is 6.38936 or whatever <laughs> number that you get. But to start with, you need some starting point. So, he says, I want your aircraft. Let us say our aircraft is something like beach starship or I would say beach duchess. Now, can you describe this aircraft beach duchess, not the actual aircraft, but what does it look like? What do you think this aircraft is? What is it? Low speed subsonic. Why do you say low speed subsonic? No sweep in the wings. Turboprops. Very good. Excellent observation. It is an aircraft with, low, with, with no sweep. And there are two turboprops. This is both, this is most probably a regional turboprop transport aircraft, uh, you know, like ATR 42, ATR 72, that kind of aircraft. So, if your job is design a twin turboprop transport aircraft, you will say, oh, like beach touches, somewhat like beach touches. So, you will say, okay, beach touches, the value is okay, 4.8, 5, okay. So, you can say, okay, let us assume S fed by S f equal to 5 and proceed further. On the other hand, Suppose you are designing a flying wing, then you will say flying wing nearly 2, 2.2, 2.1. So, you can say let us assume 2, it is for that purpose only. Okay. So, assume that you have some idea about how it will look like. Okay. Let us look at this Cessna Skyline. What do you think will be this category, Cessna Skyline? What kind of aircraft is this? Single prop, subsonic. No, single prop has subsonic, okay. Then anything else? Exactly. And to be more specific, Cessna Skyline I know is basically meant for flight training, teaching pilots. So look, there is no taper or there is a very small taper. Okay. If you give too much taper, you know there is a problem with the tip stalling. So uh, but taper gives you lower weight also. 
So they have gone for a compromise. Central portion is untapered, the end portion is tapered, and uh, the central portion is untapered because they want the flaps to be in straight uh, trailing edge. Okay. So I know Cessna Skyline is basically a ab initio trainer. So if you are given the task single seat or double seat piston prop or turbo prop trainer, you will say Skyline type okay four. This is the purpose of this graph. Okay, not more than that. Yes. No, x axis is nothing, x axis is only uh, increase in width to put more aircraft. Now what you can do is if you are smart you would say okay why take a Reimers graph, why cannot I do this for 20, 30 more aircraft types, UAV, put one for UAV. So pick up a UAV, so now all of you have been given an aircraft, have you seen your aircraft? Yes or no, how many of you have not seen your aircraft? So, I not gone to middle page, do not read my mails, karenge, dekhenge, submission is on 5th, so 4 tarik ko sochenge, kya karna hai, so 4 ki raat ko dekhenge kaha kya hai, karo, 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 aircraft drawing mein nahi chale ga hai sir, I am telling you right now, you will fall absolutely flat if you keep your assignment till last day, because it will not happen in aircraft design, in aircraft design you should see after breakfast something, whenever you have time you should find. And I will, <coughs> I will share with you, the more data you collect, the more you will start loving your aircraft, the more you will know about your aircraft. And tomorrow you will take me, sir, what do you know? I know L by D max is so much, S by S by is so much. So all of you have to calculate, not, not as in like this, you have to calculate S wet by S wet for your aircraft, okay. Now how do you calculate S wet? They will never give you. Do not think I will go and search on Google or I will go and search on Wikipedia or I will go and search on whatever. Very rarely, I, I, I can probably be wrong, some guys might be very liberal, they might say, okay, my friend, I sweat for my aircraft is so much. No, no, nobody gives you. This is the design data. So, how do you get? By? So, one, one way is <coughs> I will um, give you a small software by which you can very quickly make a 3D model of your aircraft, very quickly, okay. It is called a VSP, okay, vehicle sketch pad. All of you may be knowing about many CAD packages and all that, do not go in that direction. For aircraft design and for this purpose, you should use VSP. So, Hemant, you have used VSP last time in the design lab, does it give what it area? Ah, so please find out. If it does, if it gives varied area, it is very, is not it easy? How much time it took for you to learn VSP? I mean, it's, if you can use Windows, if you can use Excel, you can use VSP. It just says, okay, here is a huge large, what is the dia, what is the length, what is the taper, dollar, it gets and makes a nice beautiful 3D graph, okay. So, at some places you need to do little bit of godagiri also because uh, suppose it is paper then you have to give five circles in between but it is interesting, okay. But VSP might give you the area directly and it will be great. I mean I have with me some 60, 70 aircraft with their VSP models made by your seniors as part of design lab, okay. So we taught them but they said do not teach sir, it is very simple. It is a free software, it is available for download, developed by NASA for this purpose. So do it, VSP, Vehicle Sketchpad, just download this software, install it. My guess is smart people like you will take maximum half an hour to one hour and you can just take your aircraft 3 view diagram, it will be having dimensions. Like this, like this you can make your small aircraft. If not, Hemant will help you, he is your TA, he can help you in this. So I want to know as by as of all these aircraft, the exact value estimated by you, okay. Let us go ahead. Now how does the graph useful? Yes. Two slides behind, okay. How much is it? Tan square. Ah. So, weighted aspect ratio is. Wait, uh, weighted aspect ratio uh, would be B square by. S, S wet. Hmm. 
So, what is the value of B square by S weight? 90 square. Now, no, wait a minute. Maybe the value of 90 is wrong, but what, what should it be then? We have to back calculate. Okay. So, I will get, I'll get this thing corrected. I will get this thing. This is taken from the Ramos textbook. So, I will just check this and get back to you. Okay. Thanks for pointing it out. Now, let us see how does it help us? We get a sweat by SRF. Big deal. So, what? So, here is another graph, again a semi empirical graph from Raymer. What he has done is he has now looked at various aircraft type, okay, such as civil jets. So, he looks at DC 3, B4747, Gulf Stream, this is here, and then he plots a line. And this graph has L by D max here, actual value of L by D max for these aircraft versus the weighted aspect ratio, which is B square by S weight. Okay. So, he plots this and then he draws these lines as an approximate uh, curve for you. Then there is one line for military jets. Military jets has B 52, very big military jet, then you have F 86, F triple 1, Lear, etc., etc. Similarly, you have retractable prop aircraft. So, if you if you calculate or or when you look at the data, maybe you will get L by D max quoted, quoted value L by D max of the aircraft is so much. But be careful under what condition it is L by D max, you know, with flaps down or without down. Be very careful. So, we want to have clean aircraft L by D max. So, what you can do is this graph which is available now in the notes also, you can plot your aircraft and see where it is. Is it somewhere near the line or is it away from it? If it is away from the line, study the aircraft and find out why. So, when you give your submission to me in the end, okay, you are going to submit this document to me. All of you are going to submit a design report on the aircraft given to you. Now, what is design report? It does not mean that you copy and paste and say, oh yeah, design report. That is a clerical report. I want a design report. I want analysis like this. So, Raymer says this is what it is. Okay, my aircraft is this type. I, my aircraft is here. It is matching with the line or is it off the line? This data will be useful for me in future classes. I will not show this graph. I will show your graph if you can give me the data. Similarly, here you should also say my aircraft, you know, looks like this and this is the L by D. Uh, this is the uh, or that you cannot do because there is nothing on the x axis. So, you just say this is the SF by SF for my aircraft. So, how do we use this? What we do is we have to assume the wing aspect ratio. So, this is the first assumption that you have to do. When you do initial sizing, I told you that nothing about the aircraft is known. I stand corrected. You have to assume the wing aspect ratio if you use this method. Now, there may be a method in Nikolai's textbook which may have some other approach. But in Raymond's textbook, you do have to assume, you do have to assume wing aspect ratio. Then you get the wetted area ratio from the previous graph, okay, by ballparking your aircraft. And then using this graph, you can just go vertical from x axis and get the L by D max. Just follow the line appropriate to your aircraft. So, if your aircraft is fixed gear prop aircraft. That means, fixed landing gear, propeller driven aircraft like J3, Cherokee, Skyhawk, then chances are that your, uh, your uh, red aspect ratio will be between 1 to 2.4. So, suppose it is 1.8, you just go up here and read L by D max is 12. This will be a better estimate than the previous estimate. So, one thing is you start from twice the wing aspect ratio. But that is only aspect ratio, it does not take weathered area. At least this takes care of the weathered area also. So, this will be more accurate. Uh, now, more than this, probably you cannot do at this stage. Yes. So, again, how we get aspect ratio? Aspect ratio is span square by wing reference area by definition. And the weathered aspect ratio is span square by wing wetted area, sorry, aircraft wetted area. Okay. How do we estimate that? We do not have span or the area, right? At this stage. No, aspect ratio is not estimated. You have to assume an aspect ratio for your aircraft. 
based on the aspect ratio of typical aircraft of your type. Or what you can do is, what normally people do is, they assume, so they say, okay, aspect ratio will be between 7 and 10 for my aircraft type, I do not know. So I will do this analysis for 7, 8, 9, 10 and just keep a plot saying gross weight versus aspect ratio, this is what is likely to be the gross weight. So tomorrow and nowadays we do all this by coding, so there is no problem in doing it immediately. One more iteration will take another maybe 2 seconds. So it will be prudent for you to do this analysis for various aspect ratios appropriate to your range. Now do not say okay MATLAB and doubt the aspect ratio minus 10 so they get plus 20. People do it, they submit these things and they say the area is coming negative, Are I, you are putting minus aspect ratio, it will come negative, no big deal and it, you are laughing but I, I do not know how to laugh or cry when I see these assignments. <laughs> They, from their side, they are doing a nice variety, you know, <laughs> they are doing a very detailed study, but they go from minus 10 to plus 20, okay, or I will share with you one example, they were doing landing gear sizing, the aircraft was based on Boeing 737 and I was going around the class and he says main landing gear is 2 inches <laughs> and no landing gear is half inch and this guy is convinced. Sir, calculator, I said, what is your mind? 747, 737, have you flown an aircraft? He says, no sir, no, I know. I said, can you imagine there are 189 bloody seats in that aircraft, yeah. How can you have a tire of 2 inches? No sir, then I said, you were goofed up in your inches versus, you know, inches versus centimeter or whatever. It was, it was like 26 centimeter or something. No, no, that's, that makes sense. This doesn't make sense, you know. I said, okay, it's like a scooter tire. I understand. It is like, but you know, you're arguing with me. No, no, I followed your procedure. I have meticulously entered the calculator. So it happens. So when you see the number, you should believe it. Huh? You should believe the number. You don't. They don't give me a seventy-seven with twenty grams weight and all that. Maybe it's a model. I agree, but not an aircraft. But this happens. This happens, and people people blindly believe MATLAB, blindly believe their calculators, and they are adamant. Okay. So coming back now, and also please notice, Raymond also himself says, jets at Mark 1.15, poor correlation. He himself says that for this class of aircraft, there is a poor correlation, okay, uh, there is a spread. But he still gives you one graph, so that at least you can start. So if someone is working on UAVs, you can do this data for some UAVs of your class. I remember there was one student who did a BTP on hand launched UAVs. So he made this graph for some 25 hand launched UAVs, got a nice graph. He gave some new coefficients for uh, mass estimation as well as the Albedi max estimation. Okay. So is this point clear or you need more clarification? Yes. So why are two points for F104 and F104 on the screen? I don't know. I don't know why we see F104 here also, F104 here also. I really don't know. No, same aircraft, no? F104, F104, how can there be two points? See, this line, no, but see, for a given aircraft, there can be only one valid aspect ratio. There is the same valid aspect ratio. So, how can they have L by D max varying? Then it should be mentioned here. Oh, okay, what you are saying is, okay, military jets, supersonic, okay, 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 fine. So, the same aircraft 104, okay, which is a military jet, when you fly it at Mark 1.15, it falls from this to this. That makes sense. That makes sense. F4 becomes this. So, where is 102 here? 102 is not there, okay. So, that means it should be somewhere here. There is no place to write probably. F100 is here. F4 is there, F4. Yeah, F4 is there. I saw F4. I saw F104, but I don't see F100 and F10, F102. Fine. So this is this is understandable that uh, military jets and military jets because we know that it falls rapidly at high Mach numbers. So the moment you go to 1.15 Mach number, you see that L by D max falls to as poor as between <coughs> 2 and 6. It was uh, you know it was 9. It becomes only 3. Why? One third. So that is because extremely high drag. Lift you cannot increase, lift is equal to weight, you cannot keep on increasing it, but drag you have to and in wave drag what do you do, if there will be wave drag, there will be wave drag, you can minimize it, but you cannot remove it. 
Okay, good observation. So you have fixed gear prop aircraft, you have retardable prop aircraft, you have so you have military jets, you have subsonic civil jets. There are not not many more classes now. If you look at the book by Nikolai, which has come out recently, there might be more graphs. I think Nikolai has much more data, much more data than this. So maybe we should uh, switch over to Nikolai for this kind of information. So whichever source you use, there is no problem. Okay. Now <clears throat> this is actual data, actual data which was uh, taken from uh, a publication from MIT. Okay. So this is basically uh, a paper which says the historical fuel efficiency characteristics of regional aircraft from technological operation and cost perspective. So <clears throat> you can see. L by D max on Y axis and the year in which they were introduced. It just tells you that there is a continuous increase in L by D max with time. So what happens? Aircraft becomes smarter with time or it is the people who become smart with time, the designers. So the years are the years in which it was first introduced. So F-27 came in around early, late, late 50s, early uh, beginning of 60s, but L by D max was very high, okay. it was above the trend line, but this is the general growth line. Okay. Some of them are brilliant, F-28 is beyond 20, 21. So now if somebody has been given this aircraft, F has anybody got F-28? I do not think so. Okay, because these uh, uh, Fokker aircraft are actually now obsolete, so we do not have too much data available, that is why I did not go to that. Uh, but you see, uh, I think somebody has been given Shorts 360, na? Shorts 330, 360, somebody has been given. Anybody remembers? Shorts 330, 360, maybe the MTech batch. I have given this aircraft, it is a very unique aircraft. So it has got above average L by D. So most of the aircraft, they follow this line. And then there is some statement here saying that you know the cap of L by D max is generally considered to be 20 for a conventional manned aircraft, not for gliders, not for sailplanes, not for UAVs, they can have much higher values. But these conventional aircraft, man carrying aircraft, large aircraft, you will have L by D max between 15 to 20 not uh, substantially. So do not assume more than 20 even with future growth. You might say okay, the people who do aerodynamics are not sleeping, I design an aircraft today for 20 years from now, so we can assume everybody next will be 40, no. 20 is the kind of limit which you can take <coughs> because there is a limit to which you can push the technology unless you bring in some radical means of technology. Okay. So here is some actual data which is uh, from a very reliable source. I have given you the refer reference also, it is available publicly on the webs. <laughs> All right. Let us also look at now engine parameters because remember this uh, SFCs have to be assumed, C jet and C prop. <laughs> so for this we should understand first some little bit of physics about the aircraft. So jet engines, they have a thrust specific fuel consumption. So, Basically, it is fuel consumption which is specific to thrust or per thrust. So, this will be fuel mass flow per unit thrust or it can be called as total thrust produced, sorry, total fuel consumed upon total time upon thrust produced or average thrust produced. So, it is fuel per thrust per time or fuel flow upon thrust, whatever way you take it. So, if it is fuel flow, now, the units that are suggested here are either pounds of fuel per or pounds per hour of fuel flow divided by pounds of thrust. Now, this is a unit which is easily available. So, most of the data that you will get will be in pounds per pound hour. Do not call it per hour, do not cancel these two pounds. People will wait, they say per hour is so much. Because they will say pound, pound, cut, but as I mean, one of them is pound force, the other one is, and, and that is a problem in the in the FPS system. You know, the, in 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 SI system, we say Newton and kilograms. There we have pounds and pound force, slugs. 
correct they have slugs there but that is very obsolete for people who are in the current system so we don't worry about them but the units that we will use will be milligrams per newton second or milligrams per second divided by newton now why not why not use grams per newton second which is the correct si si may be it is grams no not milligram so why milligram Generally, they would be like 10 to the power minus 3 grams per newton second. So, I you can, you can, but milligrams per newton second gives you a number which is easy to remember. Instead of saying 1.76 10 power minus 3, I will say 17.6. That is easy to remember. So that's why it is given in milligrams per newton second. Okay. Now let's look at a turbo prop or a piston prop. Here there is no thrust. what does a turbo prop engine produce <coughs> it produces power it produces power <coughs> now where does the power go no propeller is that you attach on the shaft so basically the shaft rotates and during rotation it has some torque torque is force into distance so <coughs> so in the case of a turbo prop or a piston prop the engine does not produce thrust if you don't put propeller it will simply keep rotating there no motion but because there is a shaft which is rotating and if you attach a good propeller matched to the engine this propeller will now suck and throw air behind and produce thrust and therefore there will be some efficiency of the propeller also okay Okay, so <clears throat> for the propeller in an aircraft, we have what you call the PSFC, power specific fulcrum. Nobody says this. I'm just putting it so that you can register in your mind. This will be fuel mass flow rate per unit power, not unit thrust, but unit power. Now, power is measured in watts, so it will be milligram per second upon watts, or milligrams per watt second. And in the case of um, uh, FPS system, it will be pound by SHP, shaft horsepower hour. So you should be clear about how to convert one to the other because data available will not be in your units; it will be in whatever is the commercial or popular units. The popular units in aviation are still FPS, unfortunately. Okay. So here is a graph from the new edition of Raymer because it has the data in both the units. So on the left y-axis you have the jet SFC in pounds per pound hour, and on the right y-axis it is milligram per newton second. So you will notice the numbers are very simple to remember: twenty, forty, sixty. Instead of point zero zero two, point zero zero three, it's twenty, forty, sixty. And this graph tells you as a function of Mach number. On the x-axis you have Mach number. This is a very interesting graph because. in one image it captures the performance and usefulness of various types of engines used in aviation so let's look from the right side let's come from hypersonic to subsonic so in hypersonic flight you just cannot use turbo prop piston prop even turbo jet turbo fan they will not work what works only is ramjet and this ramjet becomes the the least the the least now there is a term here called as equivalent jet sfc right now you forget this consider this to be only jet sfc why is it equivalent jet sfc because all the aircraft are not jet aircraft all the engines sorry okay so we will come to this definition little bit later so ramjet you can see that it is extremely bad at it can't it can't operate at mach numbers lower than something like 1.7 or 1.6 it starts only at mach 1.6 okay and at 1.6 mach number ramjet is highly inefficient it has extremely high fuel consumption this fuel consumption improves 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 it's the best at around 3 and a half mach number now this is not every ramjet in the world this is a typical value for ramjets 
So there could be a ramp gate optimized for Mach number 4 which will have lower than this. But in general if you pick ramp jets, they are best typically at around 3.5 to 4. After 4, they start becoming bad again. So then you have to go for scramjet, supersonic combustion ramjet. They, they start again improving. Okay. You have after burning turbojet. This is the worst category. Um, you know, you can see highest SFC for all. Okay, then why do we have it? Thrust, no power. Thrust. Difference is thrust and power. Mein. This is for brute power. If you have a jet engine and if you just to save your life, you know, there is an enemy behind you, you have to run and save your life. You need brute power or you want to do something so that enemy can be destroyed. You have to put afterburner. What is afterburner? How does it or reheat? There are two names for it. So can somebody describe what is meant by reheat or afterburner? What do you do? Are, come on, propulsion guy, where are you? Yes, let me ask, yeah, what is it? So why do we inject fuel in the exhaust? No, because there is still some air which is oxygen is still available in the exhaust. There is something called a stoichiometric ratio. Beyond that you cannot consume, right? So because the exhaust of a jet engine still has burnable oxygen <coughs> and it is at a hot condition, it is at a high speed. So if you throw fuel and somehow ignite it, it is hot. If you spray fuel, it will give tremendous amount of thrust. But the problem is it is going to consume large amount of fuel, it is going to create tremendous heat stress. So you cannot do it for a very long time. Either you will burn out of fuel, burn out of fuel or you will burn the engine. So maximum continuous operation of uh, turbo fan, uh, sorry, um, after burner is probably 3 minutes or 5 minutes. If you use after burner for more than these minutes, you have to condemn the engine. Okay. So, in mid 27, we used after burner routinely in every takeoff. It cannot take off in the given runway with full armament unless you use after burner. But there is a limit. So, it is around 3 minutes, I think, if I remember rightly. So, if the pilot puts after burner more than 3 minutes, the pilot has to report it to the engineers, they will strip the engine, inspect it and then maybe certify or they will say remove the jet pipe, put a new, it is very expensive but sometimes it happens. So because of that throughout from, from 0 mark number to you know 3.5 mark number, it is going to have very high SFC. Turbo jet is high but not as high as after burner, so it goes like this, so it increases, increases, increases and then you cannot use it beyond this. Then if you look at uh, low bypass turbo fan, it is like this. <coughs> this is the high BPL turbo fan, much lower. So bypass ratio helps a lot in reducing the uh, fuel consumption. Then you have uh, turbo props and piston props. They do very well at low speeds, at low Mach numbers, but they shoot up very rapidly. At a Mach number of nearly 0.4, all three are equally efficient, roughly efficient. So that is why you will see many aircraft will have twin engine turboprop with a turbofan version of the same aircraft because if their Mach number is nearly 0 0.3 to 0 0.4, the cruising Mach number or the design Mach number, both the engines can be made to have almost the same efficiency, almost the same. So this graph is an indication for what Mach number ranges we should use which engine type. Yes. At Mach equal to 0, the SFC is whatever this number is 0.3 pounds per pound hour. That means the aircraft is stationary, the engine is on. It will consume fuel, no? it will consume fuel. No thrust, it is standing on the ground, brakes are on. The engine is on idling condition, it will consume fuel. 
then how do you define thrust? Okay, good point. How do you define thrust then? Because it is not moving, so there is no thrust. There is thrust, but the brake is holding it. The brake is holding it. If you release the brake, it will move. So, this is an indication that from very low mark numbers, okay, you might like to say, okay, ignore the 0, it is slightly more than 0, maybe 0 0.1 should be the starting point. It is just an indication that it is very good up to around this mark number, then they steeply rise. And beyond this mark number, you just cannot use them. Okay. So, there are some values given in uh, Reynolds textbook which are very uh, helpful when you do the initial sizing. So, the typical value will be cruise lighter for various types and then typical power cruise lighter for various types. Okay. This is only for information, no need to memorize them, no need to just get a rough idea of the range and either this number is given or you can assume it from the data. This is how the trend line shows the reduction in the SFC over years. So, oh, yes. Please explain from an operational perspective the difference between cruise and loiter for an aircraft. The basic difference is in loiter, you are flying. So, you will notice that loiter SFCs are always lower than cruise SFCs. In loiter, your aim is stay in the air at whatever is the optimum speed for maximum number of hours on a given amount of fuel. So, fuel flow rate is minimized and there is a corresponding speed to fly is called as the optimum loiter speed or the speed for maximum endurance. In cruise, you are supposed to fly at some mark number where the distance traveled per unit fuel is to be maximized. So, there it is a trade-off between average as we say in our normal language. What is the average of your vehicle? So, how much can you go on a given amount of fuel? And the other one is how much can you remain in air? How many minutes, how many hours you can remain on a given amount of fuel? So, therefore, the SFCs are slightly higher in cruise compared to lighter. There can be no better than lighter SFC. Lighter SFC is the best SFC uh, for an aircraft. Yeah. Correct, correct. Now, what is the reason? The reason is that in propeller aircraft, you are not producing thrust, but producing power. And <clears throat> you have to match very carefully the propeller RPM with the uh, engine power generation. So, in propeller aircraft, it so happens that the cruise values will be lower, slightly lower. Okay. But the fuel flow will be lower in propeller also. On a given amount of fuel, you will still stay longer in the air with this SFC compared to that. Because power is being, uh, see, if you look at uh, turboprop aircraft operation, what is the condition for minimum, uh, maximum endurance? It is minimum power. For, for uh, so thrust equal to drag and the two drags equal will be the condition for minimum power. Okay. So, I will come back to that later on because when I when I do the calculations, I will show you how it makes a difference. Any question? Okay. So, somebody asked once in the class, okay, these are all numerical data for existing engines, but you said you designed the aircraft today for 15 years from now, 20 years from now. So, what is the trend line for reduction of SFC with year? Just like we saw L by D increases with years because of improved aerodynamic uh, design and analysis. Similarly, SFC is reducing. So, uh, <clears throat> the data has come to me from uh, Professor Scott Everhart. Uh, so, he has given this actual data for some engines. He has not named the engines here uh, because that data is proprietary, but he says these are actual engines and he has given a plot. So, he says that TSFC could be assumed to be between 0.47 to 0.5, you know, somewhere here for aircraft in 2020. So, beyond this will be very difficult to reduce. And there was a very nice talk by Professor Riti Singh recently. He also gave some trend lines about uh, how the SFCs are improving with time and then what is the kind of a flattening which is happening. So, data is available online for what should be. So, we can take 0.5 pounds per pound hour 
as the rock minimum SFC which you can assume in your aircraft for the future. All right. Then this is the trend data for SFC in cruise for jet aircraft uh, with bypass ratio. And there is a point here that these aircraft they are heavier and they have bigger landing gear just for information. So, you could use even this data. So, suppose you are using an aircraft with bypass ratio 7, then you can say okay 7. So, we can use this SFC. If it is a jet engine aircraft with bypass ratio given, you can take from here. Okay. The next thing that we need is eta p and SFC for propeller driven aircraft. So, eta p is the propeller efficiency because whatever propeller you put to extract the power will never be having full efficiency. Okay. So, you can take it around 80 percent to 85 percent. Now, very careful design, very, pro, very nice shaping of the propeller, you can make it to 0.9 also. And there are some propeller aircraft, especially ones which are trying to push the frontier, right? like Saab 2000. Has anybody got Saab 2000? I have given that to one, maybe, maybe again some other group. So, that is an aircraft has got a maximum Mach number of 0.62, turboprop, but 0.62 Mach number. They have invested a lot in making a very accurate, very detailed propeller. Okay. Now, the last thing that you need to cover is this particular important concept. This concept you have to understand. Now, the Breguet range and Breguet endurance equations were very simple 1 by C, L by D, log of weight ratio for endurance, and V by C, L by D, log of weight ratio for range. Simple to remember an elegant formula because V is available from user, R from the user, C is assumed, L by D is if you can crack, you can get the weight ratio. Now try to derive these equations for turboprop or piston prop. You will get 1 upon root of something minus 1 upon root of something. So they are not very elegant. They cannot be used by us in this simplistic method. So they are very messy. So one solution is in the syllabus of aircraft design, we can say use Raymond's method, but do not look at driver prop and piston prop because it cannot handle it. Okay. <laughs> there is one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is do some 400 BC. What is the 400 BC you see? We will say the engine is propeller driven engine, but ultimately, what does it give you? To a propeller, it gives you thrust only. Na? So, can I consider the engine with the shaft and the propeller as a system in which I give fuel and it generates some thrust? So, can I consider equivalent jet engine for a piston prop or turbo prop? That is the whole concept. So, how you do it? You say that PSFC or power specific fuel consumption we have just now seen. That is defined as fuel flow rate upon power, right? Rate amount of fuel consumed per unit power per time. That is the definition of C power or SFC, which is power driven. What is fuel flow rate? Kilograms of fuel consumed per time. Now, so the fuel now power that is produced is basically thrust into velocity, correct? Whatever thrust is produced into the velocity is now the effective power and then you have divided by eta p because eta p is the efficiency. So, I can replace power by thrust into velocity by eta p. Do you agree or not? Now, we do some cheating. What we do is we say this t I take it inside, okay? So, it will be fuel flow rate by thrust into eta p by v. Now, what is the square bracket? Square bracket is fuel flow rate upon thrust. That is TSFC. That is how you define TSFC. So, you say that it is C jet. And now, you take this eta p that side and v that side. You will get C jet is equal to C power into v by eta p. So, why we say that for a turboprop engine, there is actually a propeller specific of power specific fuel consumption, but I attach to it a propeller of efficiency eta p 
and I make it fly at some velocity v and then it is equivalent to a jet engine aircraft giving some thrust. So, the C jet of that equivalent jet engine aircraft is equal to C power into V by eta p. So, V is known to you from the user requirements. Uh, user says no, at what speed you have to fly. Eta p is you can get from historical data or you can assume some reasonable number. So, and C power is known to you from the engine data that you will assume. Therefore, you can get an equivalent jet engine for a piston prop or turbo prop. And now you use bigger range equation because the bigger range equation does not say where is the propeller, where is the thrust, where is the engine. It just says that if it is a jet engine aircraft, then 1 by C L by D log weight ratio. So if you give this C instead of the jet C, if you give the equivalent C, it is as good as a propeller, uh, as good as a turbo prop, uh, piston, sorry, uh, as a turbo fan and tur uh, turbo jet. So this is the charge of BC we do so that we can make our life otherwise you are welcome to go ahead and play with those one by roots and all that. I have no problem. You can play with that but you will not be able to get elegant methods. By this in your code there will be only one method with one additional line. If turbo prop then C, G, C is equal to Cp into V by eta p and proceed further. So what we do is we use this C jet in the Brigade equations so that we can use them for all kinds of aircraft. Now similarly you can find out the equation for ramjet also using the similar technique. So you can say all engines are having some equivalent jet engine and we use it in the Brigade range formula and get our equation. So finally why all this drama was done because we wanted L by D. Why we wanted L by D because we wanted fuel consumption ratio. For that we have the Brigade equation. So what you do is you calculate those two segments, loose segment and lighter segment using the Brigade equation. The remaining four segments for availability from history. So now you have the mission fuel fraction. Now you bring in reserve fuel because you have to give some percentage of fuel, maybe six to ten percent. So with that you can get the unknown WF bar. Wf bar will be this 1 minus Wf W. This Wf W0 is the mission fuel fraction, the multiplication of all fractions. Recall there were there were six ratios, four came from history, two were to be determined. To determine two of them, we went to Brigade equation, one for range, one for endurance. In the equation, everything is known except L by D. So we got L by D. But then if you have C J. If you have turbo prop or piston prop, you need equivalent CJ. Now everything is available. So you can put the data, get the ratios, multiply them, get WF by W0, which is W6 by W0 in our example. 1 minus that will be the mission fuel fraction, and 1 plus RFF reverse fuel fraction will be the total. So by this, you can get the total fuel fraction. That's how they come. Now, coming back to our famous equation, we have replaced. W0 power C into A for WE bar and for WF bar we will put this expression now where this is the multiplication of those 6, 7, 8 ratios depending on your mission profile. So that is it. Now you can iterate, assume some W0 and find the RHS, keep on iterating till you converge. With that you will be able to assume. So these are the steps. First you assume, now W0 you have to assume some number to start with. This is where my thumb rule comes into picture. Remember my thumb rule which said half the aircraft is going to be empty weight, of the remaining half is payload, of the remaining half is fuel, of the fuel 20 percent is mission fuel, 5 percent is unusable fuel. So using that particular thumb rule which says that payload is going to be half of half or 25 percent which means weight will be 4 times. So you know the payload weight multiply by 4 that is a good starting point for calculation. But you might say W0 equal to 1 kg also and it will work. In 3 iterations you will get the answer. So you estimate the empty weight fraction using this formula in which A and C are available to you from Raymer's chart. KVS is equal to 1 or 1.4 if you have variable sweep. Estimate the segment weight fractions using historical data for warm up, taxi out, take off, climb. Climb can be either accelerated or normal climb. You use the appropriate graph. Cruise 
loiter, we will calculate the Brigade range and endurance formula. Descent will be 1, landing will be 0.995 because approach and landing is also from history. So, you get WF and W0, RFF is the known factor, you get WF bar. Now, you iterate till convergence. So, now the next thing that will happen will happen with the teaching assistants in the next class. So, next class is on Wednesday. On Wednesday, all of you have to bring your calculators. And if you can, if you can, I will show you one small example. This is the aircraft which will be taken up. Okay. So, <coughs> am I right? Am I the same one? Okay. So, the payload that to be carried is 150 passengers at 175 pounds and 30 pounds baggage each. There will be two pilots and three attendants at each. The range is so much, then one hour later, then descent and land. Altitude, cruise mark number. Now, first question I want to ask you is what kind of engine will you assume for this aircraft? Wrong. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. I will be miles away from turbojet. It is a transport aircraft, sir. Which transport aircraft today flies with turbojet? Turbofan. Turbojet is very, very expensive. Fuel consumption is very high only and only for military aircraft. Today it is turbofan. In fact, I will use a high bypass turbofan. Okay. Then it is a medium range jet transport aircraft. So, it will be turbofan. It says jet, but it is not turbojet. Jet means prop or jet, uh, fan or jet, turbofan engine aircraft. Okay. What will be the aspect ratio that you will choose? You do not know right now because you should look at some 10 15 aircraft which are medium range. What is medium range? Medium range basically means something like this. Now, how many kilometers is this? How do you get 4000? How do you get this number 2500, 2700? 1.853, correct, almost 2. So, it will be nearly 3000 or slightly less. So, you, you got to look at aircraft which are of this type, which fly at Mach number 0.82 at 35,000 feet or around 10 kilometers and which travel, which have a range of approximately, now range may be more, but if the range is roughly of this much, look at that aircraft. The aspect ratio will be nearly 7 to 9, that is my experience, between 7 and 9. So, you can use that ratio, but do not take my number, please find out. Okay. So, this is a mission profile. The aircraft has engine, start, take off, climb, cruise, loiter, descent, then missed approach, diversion, land. No loiter here. Okay. That is the mission profile. Do not argue with it. This is what it is. This is not our job, no? this is the customer's job. Okay. So, we have to do all the assumptions. So, I will give you some values. Okay, and then they will help you solve it. So, bring calculators all of you and you have time. So, on the Moodle page I will upload the I will upload the procedure. Whatever I told you today, I also have a small document of around 10 pages, step by procedure. I will upload the document. If some of you are little bit proactive, you can even come with some small laptop with all the, but the problem is in this classroom we cannot have laptops on every table because we do not have charging points. We do have some but not many. But you should come, so I would suggest do not bring calculators in the next class. Do it in the examination. We will have an exam of different type. But in the classroom, I wanted to come with calculators, all of you. And uh, you can discuss with your neighbor in the table, no problem. This is a tutorial, so there is no exam. It is a tutorial. He will explain to you step by step how to get the empty weight fraction. And you should be able to do it. And why should you do it? Not because I say, because you will be required to do the same thing for your aircraft. So, you have to get these numbers for your aircraft from the data. Okay. <coughs>